I want to just get set up because I have to share my screen and everything. It's a real okay. live lecture. Like, oh, real... I love it. Sweet. How exciting. <laughs> this is actually Trey's farm. Oh, it is. Okay. Yeah. Yep. I um, went up there. I want to say one strangely mild November and, um, and it was pretty beautiful. It's, it's like super beautiful. So oops, didn't mean to do that. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to wait a few more minutes, but I'm going to go fast. I appreciate people coming on time and stuff. And I didn't, I had a feeling we wouldn't have a huge turnout, even though this has been on the schedule all semester, but, um, this, conversation is worth having. And I really want it to be a conversation where I'm kind of just like structuring what I would consider to be a framework for scalability in this space. And a lot of people um, don't necessarily see it the way I see it unless we talk about it. And it's not just seaweed, it's, it's, um, it's aquaculture in general. And so just to kind of start the conversation, like, what do you guys think is scalability? Like, and it can be an oyster farm, it can be a salmon farm, it can be a seaweed farm. Yes, Erin? I think it's like, how big can you make it? Um, like, within reason, like, um, can you keep it small or can you like franchise it or um, make it like a national business? Right, I mean, yeah, you're not wrong. Right, but there's a lot more to it than just that. Does anyone else want to weigh in? Not yet. So I kind of look at this question. Clearly, there's pressure to use the oceans as right. We have increased mouths to feed on this planet. Um, there's increased pressure to figure out how to grow food in the ocean. And what had me start to think about this whole idea of scalability was the fact that we haven't been the best caregivers on land with our agricultural practices. And, and this is globally, it's, we're not, not just talking about the US, um, but I also made me think about how ocean resources and ecosystems have a much more direct way to give appropriate feedback on negative consequences, right? Where, where the land you can over, can over plant, over graze, and slowly over time, you see the effects. But in the ocean, I feel like it's a lot quicker and a lot less forgiving. So if our ocean resources fail to support far farming, the consequences are quite clear. And I would say the time frame of those consequences are quite different than the land. So the question that I was trying to answer and thinking about scalability was how do we use both the natural economic and social systems to think beyond our limited reference frames and creatively develop frameworks that bind the social, the natural sciences with sound decision making as we scale bivalve, fin fish, and aquaculture, and seaweed. Um, yes. Uh, John Han, you have a question or a comment? Yes, I have uh, some comment about it because I have went some like a uh, mm, like a uh, fish fish farms like uh, in this year, and I found out uh, there was some uh, interested points uh, when they like farm their fish, uh, because you know if you like put too much fish on the one areas that make uh, un like those fish unhealthy when they put out and send to people to eat. And uh, also it will broke the uh, stable environment uh, uh, place for the, uh, uh, for, no, uh, it will uh, break the uh, healthy environment uh, in the local lake or the local uh, uh, oceans. So um, I think the uh, scalability maybe is uh, it's why we should find a way to help the farmer or help ourselves if we have the farm to uh, put how much fish in the one area or uh, find the balance between the fishing and the uh, environment. I couldn't agree more. Um, yeah, it's really, it's, it's actually much more complicated than you think. So yes, I agree with everything you said. There are limitations. To, to how we grow uh, in these spaces. And so the next thing that I started to think about, well, so if someone were to ask me to develop a framework for 
say scaling an oyster farm or scaling an aquaculture practice or a seaweed farm, could I do that? Or even a salmon farm? And, and I'm not clear whether I have the answer to that, which is why I'm super open to conversations about it. So what does scalability mean? There, there's kind of scaling up and there's non-scalable and there's this really interesting kind of gap in how we perceive things. So scalability can mean the expansion or the ability of a system to be upscaled. And we saw this, there's a great book, which I had you guys read for this week, if you read it, called um, Becoming Salmon. It's written by someone who's an uh, ethnographer and so ethnography kind of looks at the whole in a different way than people in the environmental science space do, or at least I, I believe that to be the case. Um, and so we talked, so, the, so she used the salmon fishing as a really great example of kind of how an industry was really scaled, where it came from, what the intent was originally, and then how kind of the pressure of multinational business um, and economics really expanded that industry tenfold. And I, I, I think Carla, you bought the book, right? Did Yeah, it's actually a really fascinating book. It is fascinating. And when you look at the salmon industry and particularly in Norway, right? You think about, okay, so I don't think that was a measured expansion of an industry in a way that was sensitive to Kind of environmental constraints, but it, it definitely, I, I would say the Norwegian ethic around the environment is different than a lot of other places in the world, but it makes you think like, what's that going to look like in these other spaces of aquaculture? Um, and so what I, I wanted to just go back to that book in a sec, but I wanted to go back to this concept of shifting baselines. Does anyone know what that means? It's a great term. So shifting baseline looks at the continual degradation of its own standards and knowledge from pre-existing ecosystems over generations. So for example, someone who's born 20 years ago sees what the ocean looks like. And they see, and they have this perception of how many fish there are and how healthy the system is. But someone born 70 years ago remembers an ocean that was just teeming with fish. But over time, you see it diminished, but your so your baseline shifts. If you go back 70 years versus if you go back 20 years, the, the benchmark for a healthy system looks really different. And so in that way, your baseline has shifted, right? Do you guys understand that? Yeah, which means in my, like the way I think I'm thinking about that now, it just points out the importance of having, um, like a collaborative group of people from, you know, like really, really experienced folks who remember when that, when that time was. And then, you know, the folks that are now much more thinking about, sorry, my dog technology and, you know, not having experienced that is so much more important to have those people who had experienced it be active in, in the decision-making that is happening now. Right, you know, we have these, and John Han, I see your hand. We have these amazing books. They're actually not, um, it's not easy reading, but they're historical books. Um, oh, I'm trying to think of the name of it. I have the book on a shelf. I could go to it if, if anyone wants to know, I can go look before we hang up today. But, um, but it literally is interpreting the logs of John Smith when he first came over from Europe. When, when the US was first, discovered you could walk across the backs of cod in Cape Cod Bay. There was so much fish. You couldn't even row your boat. Now you don't even see a fish in the water. It's quite extraordinary how much the systems have changed and that we don't have that perception. And so that's a shifting baseline. Jen Han, do you have another question or was your hand just up from before? Oh uh, yeah, I have a question. Because I just read the article and it was talking about uh, some like a nuclear pollution was into our ocean recently and it will become more and more. And I was uh, interested on um, uh, if those pollutions like get into the uh, our like uh, uh, ocean systems and get into the fish, will our uh, baseline for uh, like the shifting baseline will move a lot. Like, uh, because I think it's based on how those food affect to human body. Also how those fish live in the environment. 
So if those huge uh, affected, uh, no, the huge cases into our oceans, like those pollutions, uh, how could we uh, rebuild or say, uh, re-estimate our baseline? Right, there... I, so that's a really interesting question. How do we kind of recalibrate our baselines? Because I think we become almost numb to what we're willing to accept, right? Like, and and I, I've, I've taught a class before where I talk to my students and, and I don't wanna do this again, but here I go. And, not, not, and it's being recorded too. But when I was in college and high school, you guys, people were getting arrested. They were in the streets marching against nuclear power, marching against environmental atrocities and getting arrested. Nowadays, I think it's social media has a lot to do with it. People aren't gonna stand up. And so the base, so we, we've become passive in a way where we are willing to accept more, which is really means we're willing to accept less, but we're willing to accept more offenses to our being and to our body. And Kate Orft, um, O-R-F-T, she's a landscape architect she um, has this really interesting company in New York called Scape. And believe it or not, they look at scale a lot. And she had this amazing quote um, where she looks at the disconnect between scales of action and scales of consequence. And in large part, to me, this defines the paradox of global climate change. And it defines the paradox of a lot of, of kind of how we've managed our natural resources. And in particular, it definitely defines kind of the historic mismanagement of our agricultural systems, as well as the overfishing in our um, ocean ecosystems. So I just wanna quickly go back to um, salmon farming in Norway, where where basically what was the way that they scaled it from a physical perspective? Anyone else read that besides Carla? I don't want to keep calling on her, but I'm happy to. Um, if she, I, I mean, if she wants to pipe in, if not. Um, so they modified methods, right? They modified techniques and their strategies um, were all processes to accelerate growth to an unknown trajectory, as I like to say. We don't really have a goal that we're going to, we just, um, we know we're just going, right? And so you can alter pens in salmon fishing, you can move them, you can alter feed. And, and by doing that, you have more growth. So historically salmon farming in Norway was started to supplement the dairy farmers who lived in the fjords, like in the off season when they weren't producing enough milk, they needed something to fill in the blank financially. So they started farming <clears throat> salmon. And so the uh, traditional approach was only that residents of Norway uh, and, you know, had, could be owners of these salmon farms. But then the government saw how much they were losing by not allowing multinationals to come into their markets. And they actually changed the policies to accommodate competition on a multinational level, which is kind of interesting, right? So I'm going to get a little more broad for a second. So according to like a basic dictionary definition, um, and it almost seems contradictory or opposed to common sense, but it's perhaps true is that um, scalability means that um, it just means that we can grow according to time and space. Right. But what I like to say is it's an environmental paradox because declining ecosystem services and increasing human human well-being don't necessarily go hand in hand. So as you overload a system, like Yan Han had said, right, like too much fish, less of a balance in the ecosystem, human well-being might actually be raised because of kind of the economic well-being can help bring that up. However, I feel as though there's got to be a way where we think about scalability, where these things are in concert with each other. And so we generally lack an understanding how ecosystem services affect well-being on different scales. So what I like to say is technology 
and social innovation have decoupled human well-being from degradation. And so a lot of people would say, well, that can't happen with bivalve aquaculture, but it absolutely can. So I'm gonna back up to stay at FinFish for a sec. And when we think about scaling FinFish, we think in terms of space, um, time, and feed, right? And then we, but when we think about bivalve aquaculture, we think about it quite differently. So when we think about um, bivalve aquaculture and, and even maybe somewhat in finfish, and I'm talking about bivalve and seaweed, you can think about geography 100% and you can think about spatial diversity. So you've got weather patterns, you've got unpredictable nature of weather, you get storms, you've got water temperature, you've got, and so you're at the mercy of conditions. And so having different areas definitely helps you to mitigate against weather-related issues. We've got climate, which we understand is a little unpredictable, but warming waters, more ocean acidification, potentially more algal blooms, a lot of kind of other factors are affected by climate. Um, and then we've got ecological effects. So growth rates are related to a healthy ecosystem when we're talking about uh, bivalve and seaweed aquaculture. So we look at pollution, red tide, vibrio, market interruptions, like COVID was a stunning market interruption. And then we also look at the growth weight factor and how fast species grow. And that's the single most important factor or the single most important economic factor in scalability. There's a place in um, Washington state in the United States where um, there were so many oysters in the water that the oysters in uh, uh, farthest from the shore, the cages farthest from the shore were a different growth rate than the cages closest to the shore because all of the plankton was getting scooped up by the, um, the, the critters in the cages that were closest to the source. And, and so that's kind of interesting to know. And that right then and there, that tells me there's a carrying capacity 100%. Um, and then there's this other kind of piece of scalability, which I really like to look at and I find super interesting. And it's, it's basically this vertical integration of a business. And what it, that, that could look like a lot of things could look like a hatchery. And we can add to this, this is not by any means, any of these lists are not finished lists. They're really just a list to start a conversation. So we can look at a hatchery, we can look at nurseries, we can look at grow out, we can look at distribution, we can look at retail, we can look at product diversification. Um, and so the next generation of growers, I think need to be at a scale that you can manage all aspects and then grow the business. You're controlling the cycle of the critters that you're rearing from hatchery to market. So a hatchery is the engine that really drives what you do. Um, Bill Mook of Mook Sea Farms produces over 140 million animals out of the hatchery and he sells his seed to other growers. I mean, that's a great model and it's a model for scaling. Um, another model would be to acquire companies or space in other areas that they could sell their seed as well. And then a lot of these folks, especially in the seaweed space, I notice, have their own sales and marketing teams, and they're open to sell others' products under their brand names. And that's a value-added product as well. And that's what Island Creek has done, right? And that's what Taylor Shellfish has done. I just uh, read an article this morning that um, Bill Bo Perry of Blue Evolution which is a seaweed, Bo Perry grows seaweed. He's on the West Coast. Blue Evolution is the name of his company. He had a whole incredible kind of, I want to say engine or machine, totally focused on product development, research and development in the seaweed space. He sold seaweed popcorn and seaweed pasta, and he's done away with his R&D and he's really just growing. And so, but, but so his, Scalability looks like he's growing seaweed on land in Mexico. He's growing a lot of seaweed and working with farmers in Kodiak, Alaska, and some other places on the West Coast. And so he's kind of changed his model a bit. I think um, COVID was really hard on him in, in that retail side of things. Um, and then diversifying products, right? Like we know in Maine, lobstermen are now starting to grow seaweed in the winter, right? Because they can't 
uh, grow seaweed. In, I mean, they can't fish lobster in the winter. So sometimes just having multiple products that you grow is really helpful to diversifying geography. Taylor Shellfish not only has farms in Washington state, they have farms in British Columbia and even some timber farms, which I still haven't figured out. I need to ask the question as to why, um, also in British Columbia. So I think people think that what happened in the salmon farming world can't happen in the shellfish farming world because of the environmental benefits and that more is better, but I'm kind of saying not so fast. So there's different models, right? There's the cooperative model, which is a really common model in, um, in um, Korea. It's, it's very interesting, particularly in the seaweed space where people are sharing a dock, sharing a winch, sharing resources. It creates an avenue for small farmers and startups to create their image, their name recognition. And again, Island Creek is an example where they have a lot of different farmers, um, all farming oysters, but Island Creek is the one that sells it. And then also creating your own wholesale business as well. A lot of local small farmers have created their own wholesale business locally on the Cape, Island Creek being one of them. I want to say, um, Certainly Atlantic Sea Farms is a really interesting model to look at in the seaweed space. The yeah, Green Wave is interesting-ish in the seaweed space, but they don't have products where um, Atlantic Sea Farms does. Atlantic Sea Farms, I told, I think I mentioned it to Carla, announced a new kelp burger yesterday. Did I tell you that? No, but I heard about it because I just, they tried it out the other night at a party and it's a little, it needs work according to the person who had it. <laughs> they all need work. You guys, anyone who's local, I don't, none of you are except for Carla. There's, there's a, a har kelp harvest festival last week and this week and a bunch of restaurants in New England are all serving dishes with kelp in it. It'd be curious to see if they keep them on their menus, right? As, yeah. um, it, it'll be interesting for sure. Um, I suggested and, that they add some beets because that would really help, I think, on the texture maybe. of my as an aside. <laughs> um, and so then there's the social obstacles, which are really complicated in a lot of places around the world. So there's politics, there's the regulatory and the issues, which, which is really hard to kind of surmount in a lot of different places, certainly in the United States, and I believe in other places as well. Social license, which if people, it's some the way I describe it best is people don't want to see seaweed farms out their window. And so they will fight, sorry, they will fight tooth and nail um, to not have seaweed farms out their window. Economies of scale, marketing, competition, supply, demand, cultural limitations. And by that, I mean, there's a really robust kind of clam that we have locally called a blood clam. Anyone hear of this? So the hemoglobin, so when you open the clam up, instead of all that delicious looking seawater, it's, it's red, it looks like blood. And certain um, cultures love it, and, but certainly not here in the US. And so they have this great product, but the cultural limitation of that is rather complicated. Certifications and market interruptions as demonstrated by COVID. So um, just about the social license piece, in Brunswick, Maine, a landowner got commercial fishermen in Casco Bay to hire a marketing firm and formed a group called Preserve Maine's Heritage to, to try and prevent aquaculture from being licensed in Casco Bay. I mean, people can really create a problem with social license. And then Bill Mook says people just don't want to see these small farms becoming huge corporate deals, like what happened in the salmon industry. And the huge difference are that the environmental benefits are a little bit better, right, than the salmon industry and what potentially the salmon industry brings to a region. We certainly know from, um, I wanna say just fact and history that the salmon industry in certain countries have really faced a lot of challenges from maintaining healthy ecosystems, particularly in Chile. It's really challenging when your cages you know, sink and 30,000 salmon 
farm salmon escape into the wild. It, 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 people are really opposed to this and, and rightfully so, I understand that. Um, as a shellfish grower, you end up really having to be an advocate for a healthy, balanced ecosystem. Foreign investment have been trying or have shown interest in buying small local farms, but because of regulations, it's pretty hard to do that in the Northeast. And in Maine, there's a cap on how much space you're allowed. So, and in Massachusetts, leases aren't even transferable. Um, and, and then I also already mentioned that Taylor Shellfish out of Washington state has diversified so much that they've bought timber. And then just kind of back to the physical obstacles of pollution, red tide, vibrio, algal blooms, carrying capacity, human health related disease, which I think is gonna become a really big issue as the waters form and predation is a real pain in certain industries. So the carrying capacity of farming a single layer on the ocean bottom, which is kind of more linear and less likely to exceed the ecosystem limits. But cage culture can create a problem, like in, in areas of France that they have rack and bag on top of each other. And so you can exceed a carrying capacity. It's, it's, it's pretty interesting in that note. Um, and so when it's kind of small and not industrial and you plant your seed and you grow your product, um, but you can't diversify, it's really hard to make a living doing this. And then clearly climate change is gonna be a big deal. Um, ocean acidification, is, is definitely gonna be a challenge in how we deal with that. And, and genetics potentially can help with this in certain spaces. I'm not sure necessarily with um, scallops, but definitely with um, oysters, we're doing a lot of work in the space of genetic tweaking of oysters. There's a lot of research there. Um, so there's a story about that the industry was hit hard by ocean acidification. This is the oyster industry and a seed crisis. And there became a point where there was only one, Taylor Shellfish was the only place for growers to get seed on the West Coast. And this really impacted small growers because they couldn't get seed. And so the industry actually came together to solve the problem and people scrambled to get nurseries going up and running and ensuring seed supply. So it's kind of awesome to see this collaboration across the industry, but you need to understand that, that it will, in this small kind of artisanal space, you will need that type of collaboration and openness. So I talked about kind of all of the different Things that I think about when I think about scaling, I think that there's a lot of optimism around aquaculture and, and our ability to feed the ocean. I believe that there's deep problems with pH of the water, calcification is declining, um, even lobsters are pushing more north. Like, do we have what do we think? Do we do? Should we invest in bivalves as a long-term solution? Should we invest in seaweed as a long-term solution? And then there's just kind of other space that I wanted to mention before I kind of turn the conversation over to you guys. And there's also this really interesting new push to look at cell-based seafood, which is, is part of me even challenges the question, well, do we consider cell-based or plant-based seafood, seafood. So that's, um, that's another kind of question for all of us today. But I just wanted to kind of turn the conversation back to you guys to see if, if this changed the way you think about scalability in a way. Maybe. I just think you know, I guess I just try to remain hopeful. I mean, as respects the mix of species, I think about it a little bit like